Hello everyone, and welcome to another video. It's been a while since I made a video about hydroponics at all, so I thought I would do something really interesting this time. Uh, as you can see here, the title is Futures for Hydroponics, Ideas for Future Research and Exper Experimentation. And uh, Basically, my idea here was to, to make something that was different from the usual uh, concept that people have about future and hydroponics. When people think about the future of hydroponics, they think about, I don't know, uh, shiny new hydroponic systems or um, like vertical gardens in solar punk utopias or like floating canals or sorry, canals in floating uh, space stations, things like that. I wanted more to talk about some more process oriented ideas and these are ideas that I either have done, want to try, or are am I, or I am planning to do in the near future or in the mid future, let's say. And yeah, so the contents of this um, video, basically these will be the different ideas I'll be talking about. Alternative organic nutrient sources, passive low energy hydroponics, sand ponics, seawater aquaponics, Bamboo as a self-replicating grow container, soil as a nutrient battery, and combined anthroponics. Some of these topics I have mentioned in slightly in other videos. Others you might have heard from other sources. Um, yeah, some of them are very esoteric, and yeah, I don't know if people have done them at all or if, some, if they are possible. But I included them here nonetheless because I would like to try them at some point. And the first one that I will start with has to do with alternative organic nutrient sources. So as you know from some of the videos I've done, I've experimented many times with different organic sources, uh, different organic nutrient sources. Here I've selected a few images. Um, on the top right you have an image of pre-treated urine that I used for my thesis uh, in an anthroponic system. Then you have here Bokashi leachate wood ash, uh, worm compost tea, and worm compost leachate, or vermicompost leachate. And on the bottom right you have um, green slurry, or rather slurry that ha uh, in a, this is a specific thing I will do a video about in the future, but basically uh, in the previous NGO I was uh, helping at, one of the last experiments we did uh, was that we received this new nutrient solution from a treatment plant. This treatment plant took green clippings from gardens and they would produce biogas from that and there will be a resulting slurry. So we took that slurry and we thought that we could maybe try to grow plants from it. And we did. Uh, we'll I'm hoping to write a report about it and then make a video because I have a lot of images and videos from that time. But yeah, it looks kind of like that. Um, but basically what I wanted to talk about here, other than the different things here, if you don't know uh, the Bokashi here, um, that's a very quick type of compost where you throw your food waste and you add some special organisms, microorganisms, and after under a month basically, or something like that, you basically get, a f and through a process of anaerobic fermentation, you get uh, almost like a soil and then you can mix that with your normal soil or your vermicompost and you can make new soil. But one of the things that comes out of that bin especially is the leachate. And I theorize it's possible under certain preparations maybe we have to mix it with other things, maybe we have to prepare the pH or maybe we have to filter it through a biofilter but I think it's possible to use that leachate to grow plants hydroponically same as the vermicompost tea, same as the vermicompost leachate, which I have used in the past. And I theorize also that on top of being able to use some of these independently for certain crops, it could be possible to create a recipe uh, or different recipes for different plants that optimizes things like that so that you're never short on the appropriate nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, potassium levels and other micro and micronutrients. Um, yeah, so it is, I think it's possible. I don't have the time 
right now to do that kind of experiment. So I usually focus on individually testing some of these. Uh, for example, the next thing I will probably test here is the vermin compost leachate again and the um, bokashi uh, leachate because I have done some at home. So I will probably do something with that because the other ones I've already tried and they worked pretty well. Okay, so that's one of the ideas. Something that I want to try that maybe you can also experiment with and there are probably other things here, other nutrient sources that you can do yourself that are waste streams from other processes that could be useful or fun to try in hydroponics. The next idea is passive low energy hydroponics. Now, I have done a lot of this, as you can see here in the, in the image on the left, uh, just with bottles and with wine bottles. And I do it regularly with the containers I have, whereas you add your nutrient solutions and you don't add oxygen, that's the passive. And then if you put it next to a window so it receives uh, light from the sun, then it's low energy. This is what I mean with low energy hydroponics to start with. Then I had the idea that this is so simple, maybe there's a way to really cram a lot of production in a small space. So I came up with this kind of uh, pitch you can see here on the right side. Uh, i read it because I know my, my image will be here, so maybe you can't read everything. But basically, this is an idea for a cylindrical verti vertical passive hydroponic system. I was inspired initially of some designs I saw online, although the cylinder was not uh, vertical like that. It was more horizontal, and it rotated. But that was a bit more intensive in energy because you need a, a motor to rotate all the crops to pass through the... Um, the place where the liquid with the nutrients are, even though the light is in the center. Here, you don't have that problem. The light is at the center and the plants don't move because they're already receiving all the light that they need. And all the solution they need is also in the bottle they are in. So basically, you take a huge container, you drill a lot of holes, and the holes are just small enough that you can fit the... Um, I don't have a bottle here right now, but you can fit the bottle through the neck and then the weight of the solution will keep it in place. Even as the plant grows, as it, as it gets heavier on the leafy side and as it consumes the liquid on the bottle side, it should still hold it in place. And then once it's ready to harvest, you just cut the plant, get the harvest out and remove the bottle and refill it. Uh, even just refilling the solution should could be easy um, if you add like a little tube or something. That part is not as well sketched out. Uh, in any case, as you can see by the image, I did actually try to build that and I was pretty close. I had the light. I just needed to mount a fixture, maybe get a little fan. But then I had to move my apartment and I had to get rid of that. And yeah, I never had the patience again to get something that big and to drill the holes again and to go through that process. And, and at the end, I also realized that it's not that low energy because I still rely on the electricity for the light. So what I'm trying to do now instead is I have a collected a lot of wine bottles that I've consumed over the years or other bottles made of glass and I'm planning to build a shelf and that shelf will be facing a window or um, the entrance to my balcony here. So it will be indoors or it can be outdoors anyway. But then the, the bottles are placed basically tilted so I can fit a lot of them, and it's kind of the same concept, really. Uh, I fill the bottles with the nutrient solution that the plant needs, and if something happens, these are even easier to move out, refill, add back in, and I'm reusing material. In this case, I'm not using plastic, I'll be using bottle. I think the bottles are a bit nicer, and you don't have to worry about the microplastics. And yeah, I think that's, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm trying to get the wood to build the shelf and when I actually do I will actually make a video about that. But this is kind of the ideas that I was that was at just a few years ago and I've kept on thinking about them. Um, what else about this? I'm trying to read here because I have so many things to talk about. Alright so I think in terms of uh, passive low energy all the ideas I had here were related to mineral hydroponics but it is possible that some forms of organic hydroponics that don't require the constant aeration of the solution or to pass it through a biofilter constantly, maybe those could work also. So 
by designing something that could work for mineral hydroponics and then focusing my energy on developing organic hydroponics or bioponics, then you can actually just adapt the existing structures you've made for the mineral ones, for the organic ones. And I think that's, that's the best of both worlds, really. Then here I have the, uh, the idea of sandponics. And, and this, is, this isn't really my idea. There's people that uh, have tried this. As you can see here, there's an image of basil growing in sand in a hydroponic system. What I did think about initially was when I w watched the movie The Martian where this astronaut is stranded in Mars and he has to fend for himself. He actually takes the inert Martian soil and using a process of yeah, uh, composting his own uh, waste, his own poop, he's able to grow potatoes and keep himself alive. So I kind of designed here an experiment that I wanted to try back when I was in this organization which was basically to take something inert resembling Martian soil, which could be sa normal sand, and then through a process of vermicomposting the waste that's created by the initial growing in that, um, in that inert soil by adding mineral nutrients, or also by adding um, urine and processing it like in an anthroponic setup, you could enrich that sand and eventually create like actual Martian soil, so to speak, or, or in a simpler case, just enriched sand soil, which doesn't even count as hydroponics anymore because it has become soil, because it has the nutrients and has retained the nutrients there, and it's living soil. Um, so here, the, I'm actually talking about two ideas relating to the sand ponics. There's one idea, which is to use sand as a substrate and adding the nutrients, which can be mineral nutrients, or it can be like aquaponics. There's actually a very interesting video I saw from a YouTube channel called My Aquaponics, and he has built very big media beds just with, so, uh, with sand, and his aquaponics is powering it, and he had a massive jungle. I can actually put the, the video I saw on, on the description of this video so you can check it out. So that's one idea. And the other idea is to use the principles of hydroponics, and specifically organic hydroponics, like anthroponics and and also the whole vermicompost section that sometimes we use to start our seeds, using that to actually create soil. So you start with hydroponics and then you create soil and then you, you keep that soil and you keep it alive. So those are basically, yeah, the, the main ideas I would say here. Another concept here is seawater aquaponics. So here is basically exploring really the concept of aquaponics even further, because aquaponics is is an ecosystem, but it's a small ecosystem, and it's limited by the fact that it's fresh water. Now, the fact that it's fresh water allows us to grow a lot of hydroponic crops, whereas if we use seawater, we would not be able to grow basically all the food that we eat because those crops can't stand the seawater. But maybe there is a way to construct an aquaponic system where the main idea is not to grow the typical crops like vegetables and fruit, but rather to grow the marine crops that we also consume, but we don't think about so much when we think about hydroponics. So by opening up the aquaponics to the seawater realm, suddenly we can grow things very diverse, like this sea pickle here you can see on the left side. Then you have all the other types of fish that suddenly are possible with salt water that are not possible usually with the fresh water. Then you have also seaweed, you have crayfish, uh, already in fresh water it is possible to grow crayfish in some aquaponic systems, but it's freshwater crayfish. And here, by having seawater, you could grow saltwater crayfish or marine crayfish. Also thinking about mussels as a plant of sorts, you could say. They are also a filtrator. If you have fish that you're raising in a sort of aquaculture system, they produce the waste. The mussels here, or other mollusks or filtrators, they can use those nutrients to grow themselves, and that's a crop, basically, that you can consume, or you can even feed to a farm if you have, you can feed them to chickens or things like that. So y it's kind of thinking, expanding the concept of the ecosystem of aquaponics to include a lot more other um, organisms, basically. And thinking about it, not just in terms of plants that are growing with the roots exposed uh, in towers or such, but also other 
aquatic organisms that maybe are completely submerged all the time, as is the case of the, the sea pickle or the seaweed or the mollusks. Mm, yeah, uh, the other things that could easily be in integrated here is shrimp and barnacles. Some some of the things I like to eat in uh, Portugal are like goose barnacles. I wonder if that could be possible to grow in a in an aquaponic system, for example. But yeah, I know there are s there is some work starting to be done in, with this. I don't know if it's completely possible because there's a lot of challenges already to grow just the fish by themselves in a closed land-based recirculating aquaculture system because the yeah the ten the parameters that you have to deal with are very precise and i could imagine it can be hard to integrate some of these organisms if you don't have a lot of um, compensating systems which means basically that you will have less production overall of what you want to produce but at least everything will be well main maintained and you don't have to worry about imbalances and, and I don't know, diseases spreading throughout your system or, or yeah, other things. But yeah, this is basically some ideas that you can think about also if you, if you have the space and resources to try it out, I would say go for it. Um, do some research, make videos and share your research. Uh, if I ever do have the space to do this, I would definitely share everything that I'm learning and uh, get feedback also and ideas and, and things like that. That's where we're on YouTube to share things. Now here we go into the more um, esoteric ideas. So as you may or may not know, bamboo can be grown hydroponically. And after the bamboo is grown, whether in soil or hydroponically, you can also use it itself as a container really. So here you can see some NFT, well, this I've seen NFT channels like this. In this case, it's actually soil. But these are the thicker types of bamboo. If you have small types of bamboo here, you could actually, um, here in the bottom, you can actually arrange them s in a similar way and make like frames like you could see here. And then make like a box of those, yeah, bamboo tubes. And then fill it with a pond liner inside. And suddenly you can do hydroponics again. Or you could process that wood and make actually something very refined, like an actually grow container. And then you could also add a pond liner, for example, some other material. And yeah, use that as a future hydroponic container. But the really, I think, interesting part here is to think about how that one crop, uh, when you are growing it, you can use it to to create something that can grow other things. So in a sense, it's like if you have a 3D printer that is made of a lot of parts of plastic and you're printing parts of plastic that then you can use to build other 3D printers. It's like a replicating system, if you understand what I mean. So in a sense, here my idea is that one day I would like to try growing the bamboo and use that to grow more uh, hydroponically and use that to create containers that I can grow future things uh, hydroponically as well. Kind of like an organic 3D printer, if you will. Um, I don't know if it will be possible to grow the bamboo that I want or the bamboo that is good to build things with, but I think it's worth a try. And bamboo looks really good um, in terms uh, as well as aesthetically and as well as in terms of function. It's also very good, um, a good material. It's hardy. Uh, in some NFT canals I've used, I've seen y being used for uh, hydroponics. Uh, yeah, you don't need to line that with anything. The water just flows and sure, there might be some algae growth, but it does the job done. So I would definitely like to experiment with this someday. Okay. Here is uh, one more uh, esoteric idea. So here, I my, my claim here is basically that we should think, uh, or maybe it's, there's some advantage to thinking of the soil, not only as a, as a living kind of organism, that's like one uh, philosophy that you could look at as a soil, but another one, maybe a more utilitarian or industrial idea would be to think of the soil as a battery. Uh, except instead of a normal battery that you charge it with electricity and it discharges electricity, here you charge it with nutrients and you discharge it with nutrients. 
So uh, there, as a battery, you have inputs, of course, how you charge the battery, and then you have the outputs, how you're using the battery. In terms of inputs, of course, you have um, what actually is bringing back the nutrients to the soil. Usually we talk about processes such as composting, vermicomposting, adding the compost leachates that are produced, bokashi composting, uh, yeah, things like th of that sort, or even um, manure from other animals. Those are all different types of ways you can bring back or charge the soil in that sense. And then once you have that charged soil, so to speak, you can discharge it at different rates depending on what crop you're using and how intensive you are using the soil. So if you're doing a lot of intensive farming, you're going to discharge that soil pretty quickly. And if you have a lot of demanding crops, you're also going to discharge that soil pretty quickly. That's in a sense why we have a problem with soil nowadays, because we've been using it a lot. We've been discharging the soil a lot. And actually the soil, the natural soil we've been using takes a long time to charge back through natural processes. Whereas if you have a more of a local production with or like a permaculture and you're adding back the the nutrients back to the soil very very often then you never have that problem you can actually create soil out of soil that was previously not fit for growing but to take this idea f further i even thought about how if you think about it in a battery i mean you here you see an image of uh, the soil uh, in its mostly solid form but Perhaps it could be possible that you create some sort of reactor and you add the the waste streams, the things that add the nutrients back, you add that in a pulverized state or in a liquid state. And in that reactor, you're constantly adding oxygen or you have like a sequence where you have oxygen and you don't have oxygen and you mix it very well. And maybe there could even be some some places, maybe it could be suspended, uh, I don't know, suspended particles where the where you have special bacteria that are always growing there, or I, I would prefer not to use plastic, but it could also work in principle like a uh, moving bed bioreactor. But anyway, the idea is that you, you have all, all this reactor where things are always mixing, always... Uh, moving always you're always adding some energy to it to make sure the metabolic processes that are going on in the in the microbial uh, fauna is happening you add that and once you kind of think that that is enough then you could like stop that and press and only get the liquid out and use that liquid in a hydroponic way so in a sense you're using the soil as a medium to create um, hydroponic nutrients and then after you're done with your growing you can add some of that leftover nutrients back or through your composting processes you can also add that in a more liquid way so if the idea is that you don't have to you don't have a lot of particle if you have a lot of particles it's gonna be very hard to mix but if you keep it mostly murky uh, w maybe a bit thick but not too th sludgy thick if I make myself clear, uh, maybe that could be very interesting in terms of home brewing your own hydroponic solution by adding uh, solutions or waste streams from other processes. I don't know. I think this would be very complex, but I, if it works, it could be very cool and it could open up a lot of uh, doors in terms of ease of um, once it's streamlined, it could be like very easy to to create your own nutrient solution at home from your food waste, for example. So yeah, that's uh, one more idea. And I think the final one is, um, yeah, combined anthroponics. So in my channel, I've talked a lot about how anthroponics can be. And most of the times I've worked with urine anthroponics, but actually back when I had a, a working website about this, I already theorized that you could maybe use um, anthroponics in a way that uses both your waste streams, so both um, both urine and feces, type 1 and type 2, let's say. So here I, I have a diagram. Um, 
where I try to sketch that in a very simple way. So you have your person, you have the toilet, you divert the waste streams. And the top part, you have the typical anthroponics waste stream, which is the urine is um, exposed to microorganisms and they convert the nutrients to plant available nutrients and then you can grow your plants. Or the feces are exposed to black soldier fly larva and that larva after treatment and some process can become suitable for fish feed. Then you're incorporating the aquaponics part into this. And then that fish can be like its own in an aquaponic system that is feeding the plants, for example. Here in the right, you can see a bit more in detail each step. So you start with the bio waste separating toilet and the urine, you have your aging container and then you pass it through a biofilter and then you, it goes to your hydroponic system. And the feces, you have the biocomposting with the uh, black soldier fly larva. Then you get the larva. They are self-harvesting, so it can maybe be easy to do this in a way that you don't have to be expose yourself to the the very nasty smell of having to deal with your own uh, waste in that sense, I hope. Uh, but I assume this would be very difficult to try. And then after that, you can freeze your larva and you can probably also um, blend them. And then you can add them to your fish tank. Uh, of course, here, <laughs> the problem here is, of course, what's going out of your waste, your type 2 waste, because if you have issues they could easily go into the larva which are going into the fish and then if you eat the fish you're going to get those problems or the fish waste could also maybe bring them back to the plants uh it can be complex to figure out and i think that i i don't think i would ever try this unless i had a farm or i had access to a lot of um funding to and laboratory equipment and laboratory testing so to make sure all the pharmaceuticals that we worry about are not entering the the edible part of the system at all. Um, I, but I think just the smell alone, figuring out how to avoid the smell and building something that doesn't smell is the most complicated part. So yeah, that's one part of the combined anthroponics idea. And then the other part here in the bottom left is constructed wetlands. They're a very common type of hydroponics si or anthroponic system the people don't really think about it in that sense they they don't call them hydroponics but they are hydroponics and yeah it's a type of wastewater treatment um where you kind of have this this root area with very special plants and you have all these microorganisms there and they c take care of the um, the combined waste that you flush down the toilet so in this sense you don't have to divert the waste now i added this here because these plants, they are mostly used for their properties in st uh, stimulating the treatment of the waste. But perhaps it's possible that you can still do this and grow plants that have some more use. Maybe not edible use, maybe that's too dangerous. But maybe something, I don't know, some, some sort of uh, medicinal properties maybe or some sort of uh, inks. Maybe you could grow plants that you can extract inks from and you can use that to paint things. Or maybe even just uh, construction material. Maybe there's some plants that are a bit more woody and you can harvest these without affecting the treatment process. So I think if that can be done, and this is, th this is last, uh, I put this last as an idea because I think this is what takes the most resources to figure out the most complex and it's what is the most difficult to work with because you're dealing with a lot of smells but yeah I think these are basically all of the ideas that I had these are ideas that I want to try out at some point I'm gonna probably start from the beginning of the ideas and whether I will get to these last ideas or not remains uh, a mystery even to myself but do you have ideas I mean about things you want to try at hydroponics that you don't really see often let me know. I would love to um, yeah, talk about them or learn about what you're doing. Maybe you're trying different things with urine. Maybe you're trying different things with other types of composting that I don't even know about. Maybe you've developed your own way to create uh, a special recipe of nutrients you're already using in hydroponics. Or maybe the soil battery, you've already done something like that yourself. 
or something I can't even think about. Just if you like this video and you have your own ideas, just let me know. Or do people even do uh, YouTube replies anymore? I mean, like the video replies. I don't know, but if they do, you can also do that. Otherwise, reach out to me on on YouTube and and on Twitter maybe. And yeah, uh, I hope you enjoyed the video and uh, see you in the next one.